This is Father Gregory Pine. This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. This is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all of those who support us. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning on your podcast app or on YouTube, wherever you consume these here episodes. All right. So um, as has become our custom, uh, we've we've begun Lexio with uh, favorite this or most terrible this or yada 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 and such for this. Uh, but we've kind of run out of Lenten themes, so we're going to do a you know the kind of lightning round here, which is a favorite of whatever sort you yourself prefer. And uh, there's no better man to start things going than Father Bonaventure, who is a wizard of improvisation. So Father Bonaventure, your thoughts on favorites of whatever sort? Oh, it's too much. It's like a it's like a menu at an IHOP or something. Like everything's fantastic, or a Mexican restaurant or something like that. But I'm gonna go. I was thinking about doing favorite reptile, and that's an Arizona chuck walla because it inflates. But I'm gonna go and take instead uh, favorite object on my desk because I've always thought. And by the way, in the comments, please, please like this so that Father Jacob Bridgman will agree to do this. I've always thought we could do an object explaining episodes, like a special series where we talk to objects and ask them to explain themselves, just random objects. Wouldn't you love to see us? talking to objects and answering questions to them, sort of David Foster Wallace, like brief interviews with hideous men style thing. Put that in there. Anyway, my favorite object that is within reach, that's the category, favorite object within reach, um, as you saw me reach, is on my desk. And this this could change, but right now it's this. So this is one of those little, um, what do you call it? Uh, Dolls. Little, drop, little drops of, no, it's not a doll. Uh, a drop of... <laughs> You know, just because you have them. Okay, um, so this is like a little drop of water thing, whatever. So it's it's Faustina, and there she's got the Divine Mercy thing right there. It's very accurate representation of her. Let me see if the camera, it's always focusing on me. Oh, there she is. Boom, replace me. Um, and they're kind of like, they're fun tactile things. It's a little, you know, you, you might have this because if you have children, you might have these things, or if you're a Dominican friar. Um, but there's, it feels good. It's like a heavy kind of weight. Um, and, it you know, it looks good on a desk. Anyway, why is my favorite one? Because I love Faustina. She's my favorite. Um, she's fantastic. A wonderful saint. Great to pray to. Great to pray uh, with. Uh, read the diary. All this. But secondly, because it was given to me by, it's RCA season um, this time, and this was given to me by a RCA student, a freshman at Providence College named Hannah. I won't do her last name. Um, but she knew I love Faustina. And so she was uh, confirmed in the church and she was excited about this course. And so she she gave me this uh, this little little Faustina, um, not a doll, uh, figurine, man, man figurine. It's a, it's a Faustina man figurine. And that's at this moment, my favorite thing within reach. Oh my gosh. I can't believe you just talked about that for over two minutes. Like, <laughs> also what? just for the record, Father Bonaventure, people don't like things in the comment section. People leave comments <laughs> in the comment section or like the video. So just so you're aware. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of things on this desk that I'm sitting at right now. I'm looking. I've been looking. I don't know. So I'm going to say this. On my Nalgene, I'm kind of, it's a little dirty, um, but I, the Nalgene that is, I have a sticker from Rita's. You can see, focus. There it is. There he is. Sweet. Rita's Italian Ice Place. Um, the sticker's not my favorite, but it's really hot in my office right now because like the HVAC things are going off. So every time I look over and I see, I really like Rita's italian ice and it's like anti-lent you know no dessert blah 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 so it's just i like that it's kind of like a little figurine but it's a sticker version so there done boom father so gregory like, what like, you got if you, if you like rita's <laughs> like it in the comment section and uh, it'll be great for them i'm, freaking, I'm like 40 um, years old okay i don't know what these <laughs> things are <laughs> I suppose the thing, I mean, working within the ambit of things that are close at hand, kind of on your desk and favorite, um, I've been I've been doing a lot of uh, low cost podcast improvement workaround solutions as of late. Um, as maybe I've mentioned on the podcast, it's a perpetual struggle to get the internet to work in Switzerland on account of the density of Alpine ranges. Um, but uh, I've been told that I'm pale and I look tired, hungry, and uh, and otherwise bedraggled. So I, I was told that lighting helps, but then I like looked at lights and they're expensive. And I was like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. So over here, I have a janky light setup and it consists of a piece of wax paper from our basement, like the type of thing that oh. you would cook chocolate chip cookies on top of. Mm -hmm. And then I have it fastened to the wall by athletic tape. 
because mm. on account of the fact that it's wax paper, it's nonstick. So most tapes don't work with it, but athletic tape does. So if you're wondering what kind of low cost operation we're running over here to make things work, it's that kind of low cost operation. So I'm very proud of that. And especially because it probably infuriates Father Jacob Bertrand. So on that note, it does. we're going to. Tr- well, I was going to say one more thing, if you if you don't mind. I thought the <laughs> your favorite thing was going to be the 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 light dangling from the wall behind you because that's that's my favorite. It's not within thing. reach. It had to be within. That's it wasn't just on desk. Within okay. reach. My mistake. Yeah. But I, I love that. No, that's a that's dangling. a great light back there. For all of those watching on YouTube, I have an inexplicable light mounted to my wall. But on account of the fact that this is not my room and I am a mere passer through, I can't remove it. I suppose I could, but well, I haven't. All right. On that note, we will transition seamlessly into the opening prayer for the Mass of this fifth Sunday of Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God. May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. All right. Father Bonaventure, if you would take us into our first reading. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who opens a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, who leads out chariots and horsemen, a powerful army, till they lie prostrate together, never to rise, snuffed out and quenched like a wick. Remember not the events of the past, the things of long ago consider not. See, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In the desert I make a way, in the wasteland, rivers, wild beasts honor me, jackals and ostriches. For I put water in the desert, and rivers in the wasteland, for my chosen people to drink, the people whom I form for myself, that they might announce my praise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This, Isaiah is just wild. It's like, you know, reading... Isaiah's, you know, his job as a prophet is to prophesy, who would have thought? And in his prophecy about what is to come and what the Lord is going to do, um, he talks about jackals and ostriches honoring God. And it's kind of, it's like, okay, maybe that's great. I don't know. Um, But that's not, that was just more an observation than the point that I want to make. But the point that I think I want to make here with respect to Isaiah's prophecy is that as it's, it's it's in keeping with the series of readings that we've had through Lent, through each Lent, through Advent too, you know, through these preparatory seasons, in that in through the prophets, our Lord gives testimony. The Lord testifies to both the past and the future. He testifies to what he has done um, by way of example. So we have the, the, the creation narratives. We weren't there for that, but he reminds us of how he created, how who he is and how he created. We have the testimony of the Exodus and of the Israelites coming into the promised land. We have all of this, the testimony of, of defeating the enemies of God. We know what, you know, the power, the might of God in the past. And in doing so, God also testifies um, as to what is to come. But in giving us in giving us the the sort of prefigurement, the testimony of what is to come, he does so by reminding us, by calling our attention to the fact that what is to come, however spectacular the things in the past were, what is to come blows these out of the water. It's even more spectacular uh, is what what awaits us. What's to come um, doesn't simply have to do with the changing of nature of 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 creating rivers in the deserts and moving mountains and all of these things that our Lord can do. It doesn't have to do with having uh, victory over enemies and war and escaping and and these sort of things. Um, Again, it's even more spectacular. What is to come is our salvation. What is to come is the Savior, the Messiah, and uh, the accomplishment of his work. Uh, Sometimes we might think of the Old Testament as sort of these Un, what un, unrelatable kind of grand stories of, of an angry God. But in reality, that's, that's not what our Lord is revealing. He's revealing to us his, his might and his love and, his, um, and his, his, his dedication, I guess we could say, to working such miraculous things in our own lives, if we are but present and attentive to them. So there are elements of this reading that refer directly to Exodus 14 and 15, 
which recounts the passing of the Israelites through the midst of the Red Sea, and then their rejoicing as Pharaoh and his chariots and charioteers are destroyed in the midst of that sea as it collapses upon them. And then the imagery that's used to describe our Lord's promise or our Lord's bounty or our Lord's blessing is often water imagery. So in the middle of this kind of recounting of the past or um, kind of memorialization of the past, then there's this description of the Lord doing something new. So it seems as if this particular passage focuses on that line, I am doing something new. And I think that helps us, you know, given the Old Testament backdrop, and then given our own reception and appropriation of that in the Christian tradition, it helps us to appreciate the fact that there is something new in the baptism that we have received. Because it's not just, right, a rite of passage. It's not just a, a dead religious ceremony that you have to kind of, whatever, check off your list at the age of whatever, three days, if you're born in the 16th century, or maybe three weeks, or whatever. I mean, whenever you decide to have your children baptized. Um, but it's, it's the source of a life, right? It's the source of a life which is organic. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He is the vine, where are the branches. There's something of the very sap of God that's, uh, that's at work in our lives, which has its own interior dynamism, which has its own kind of interior logic even. And so I think that to, to recognize the fact that there is something new and that that something new is actually at work in my members is very encouraging because then that can chasten our desire to kind of get out ahead of the Lord and say, all right, if this is going to get done, I have to get it done. Well, we, we, we do so with the confidence that our Lord is already present. He is already at work. And even the very desires that we have are themselves first his gift. So yes, the Lord is doing something new and it is present in your members. The word that came out of my mind from this reading is conversion, because what's happening here is, is a bunch of conversions. And usually we think of conversions as being about people, and it is ultimately about people. This is about Lent. It's about returning to the Lord, especially as we approach Palm Sunday and, and the, the, the Holy Triduum. But in this passage with Isaiah, as Father Jacob Bertram mentions, it's wild in that they're conversions of elements. So this is elemental conversion and then animal conversion, right? You're converting desert sand into water, you're converting deserts into water places so that now you have one element into another, however that occurs. And then you have animals going from wild beasts to praising the Lord, which I assume is something like tame beasts since wild beasts yelling don't seem to praise him particularly, or at least it's inclined to say that. There's a lot of biting involved with wild beasts. Of course, ostriches, it's hard to imagine how those are wild beasts. They just look like kind of big, dumb birds. Um, but anyway, the, the Israelites were scared of them. And these, con these were converted into things that were, were good and were good. Now, of course, as you're reading this, the passage, I assume the people's mind is saying, well, if they can convert, if God can convert elements and beasts into these other things, then, then what about us? And in a sense, that's a deeper conversion. Converting, and it's something that only he can do. When we, we talk about changing things or converting things, we're really just like moving stuff around. We're changing things in a way, but we're always working with matter. But God works in a deeper way. He works with natures. He works with being. He actually can convert things. This is the truth of the sacraments of the Eucharist, of course, that he converts bread and wine into his body and blood, soul and divinity. That's a deep conversion. And it's a model for the conversion that he does in us in this Lent, that he converts us, if we allow him, if we allow him on our journey, to be converted away from something that's stark, like the desert and, fruit, and, and has no fruit, or something that's wild and, and bays against him, to something that is fruitful in our experience of, and of our preaching of the Lord, and also something that praises him. All right, we'll turn then now to our second reading taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have accepted the loss of all things and I consider them so much rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having any righteousness of my own based on the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, depending on faith to know him and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings by being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It is not that I have already taken hold of it or have already attained perfect maturity, but I continue my pursuit and hope that I may possess it, 
since I have indeed been taken possession of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I for my part do not consider myself to have taken possession. Just one thing, forgetting what lies behind, but straining forward to what lies ahead, I continue my pursuit towards the goal, the prize of God's upward calling in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, so in, in reading this particular passage, we have St. Paul describing at length the resurrection from the dead, and the longest treatment that he gives to that is in 1 Corinthians 15. So I'm thinking about some of the things that he says here in conversations with some of the things that he says there. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that the order of the resurrection is Christ the first fruits, and then all of those who belong to him or pertain to him. And here you have some of that similar language of possession. You have some of that similar language of a kind of personal appropriation. And he's describing in this passage both the resurrection of the body and the resurrection of the soul. Um, when St. Thomas reads this passage, he talks about it in terms of, so the resurrection of the body being the physical general resurrection, and the resurrection of the soul, he just aligns with the infusion of grace. So we who are dead in sin are raised to life by the gift of Christ's grace. And this is all you know, placed in this interpersonal context, such that we partake of grace and we partake of the resurrection which follows upon grace by virtue of the fact that we share a relationship with the first fruits of that movement. So Christ, by the power of God, raises us from the dead. But in order to do so, he uses his resurrection as the instrument of that action, as the instrument of that motion. So there's a sense in which, like in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he is using different means to draw us more deeply into, you know, friendship with him and love with him. And one of those things is the resurrection. So he kind of sets it before us as a way by which to draw us in, as a way by which to captivate us, as a way by which, yeah, how would you even describe it? As a way by which to conquer our hearts or conquer the obstacles that remain to our full partaking of the grace which rises us from the dead and to the effect thereof in our resurrection at the end of the age. Our, our life as Christians is a constant, um, I think, reprioritizing or constant, yeah, prioritizing of our lives. We see this, uh, I mean, I guess we can point to a ton of examples throughout the scriptures, but we, we can look to our own lives as evidence of that, that it's very easy to substitute um, whatever idols, whether that's ourself, other earthly material goods, other things in place of, of God who ought, to, who ought to be our first priority, you know, our first the first in our sort of hierarchy of pursuits and hierarchy of goods. It's just we, because of our fallen nature, the habits that we've built up, we have a tough time kind of living in that. And hence the whole purpose of Lent a season to um, reprioritize, to look again at our lives and and where it is that we have placed our relationship with, with the Lord. In St. Paul's letter uh, that we just heard from, and as Father Gregory was commenting, as he St. Paul writes to the Philippians, um, is basically a, a call in some ways to recognize a sort of reprioritization again, that that nothing matters compared to what God is doing in our lives, that everything ought to be relative to that reality, that that nothing nothing ought to trump uh, the the reality of God, who he is, and the call that God has has issued to uh, to us to share in his life and the the grace that he offers to do that. And as we're in the fifth week of Lent, as we're beginning entering into that, as the Triduum nears, to, to St. Paul calls us to look at the mysteries of of Holy Week, of Easter, um, anew with with eyes that have um, that have been purified through weeks of, of penance and fasting and, and prayer uh, to see God's work um, in our lives in a way that that is is yet again for and foremost. This passage uh, from Philippians reminds me of my, my time when I was a student at Grove City College, an evangelical before I was Catholic, uh, and I was a uh, resident assistant, an RA on a hall, and our resident director, Mr. Andy Tonzik, was a Catholic, but he, he, he led Bible studies or meetings with us, and he had us memorize certain passages. Uh, it's a sort of general evangelical thing to do, but it's good for Catholics too, I suppose. And this was one of the passages, Philippians 3.10. Um, I want to know the power of Christ and the fellowship of sharing his suffering, so has somehow to attain 
to the resurrection of the dead. That's a different translation than we have here. I think it's probably the NIV classic evangelical Bible thing with study notes. Um, but it's it's always stayed with me that that notion. I want to know the power of his re- of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing his sufferings, so that it's, I may somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now that's interesting because it's like an RSR loop, as you might think. The order is bizarre. You might think I want to know the sufferings of Christ so that I might attain to the resurrection. But instead, it's I want to know the resurrection and then or with the sufferings so as to attain the resurrection, RSR loop. And I think that's a good loop. That's a good experience or a discussion of of what it means to live the Christian life here and now as an already and yet not yet presentation. We do have, this is the claim of Easter and the claim of, of Christ, the power of the resurrection that we can tie into with the sacraments and with grace, that we can live the risen life, walk in the spirit, uh, in baptism and in grace. And that's what we're aiming for. But we also have a fellowship in sharing the sufferings of Christ, that this life after the power, even after the power of the resurrection, after this Easter, it is very likely that you and I will have some suffering. Seems unlikely that we won't. And yet that can be turned, of course, again to the resurrection, this time of the resurrection of the dead, of salvation, so that there's an already present resurrection, the power of the resurrection, and yet a not yet, the fellowship of sharing the sufferings. But both of those things, the power of the resurrection and the sharing of sufferings, is for the final resurrection uniting with Christ in eternal life. All right. We can turn now to the gospel, if you would take us there, Father Jacob Bertrand. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This passage is interesting the Gospel because it's the only time that Jesus writes something. Writes something. And it's, it gives a reason why, for instance, uh, he came at a particular time he came, because there weren't cell phones, and so no one could take a quick picture of what he was writing, and therefore have that, because he didn't apparently want to have anyone to have this writing. The, he writes in possibly the most erasable of all mediums back then. He writes in sand. So it's as if he's just scratching the surface of, of, of writing something, but he's not interested in really actually writing. Because, as St. Thomas says, the, the best philosophers don't write. Socrates wandered around and just mumbled, um, and people followed him. And, uh, but, and so Christ teaches in the way of these great philosophers. He teaches by word of mouth for all sorts of reasons. Okay. This has not stopped people from wondering why. What's he writing? What did he write? And of course, some maybe the sins of the Pharisees, um, others that he's just writing, he's just doodling because he doesn't take the Pharisees and the Sadducees seriously. And so he's just kind of fooling around on, on the sand there. And John Calvin takes that interpretation and says, that's what we're supposed to do with the papists as they try to, you know, cavil against us. Just don't treat them seriously or something, what have you. Um, I I don't know. In some ways, the most beautiful part about it is it's a mystery that even so God himself, of course, is a great mystery and why he providentially does things in this world are mysteries. But even incarnate, you know, in a sense that when Christ, when God becomes incarnate, it doesn't all of a sudden go from being a mystery to now everything's explainable. Then we know exactly what Christ is up to at all times because, you know, he's got flesh and he's, he's a, you know, he's a, he's, well, he's, he's a, he's a man, right? He's divine, but he became man. So therefore he gave up on divine mysteriousness. And that's not true. He's still the divine person, second person, of the Trinity. He's still mysterious. 
there are still things he does that we can't understand that leave us to hold him as the divine person that he is so that it's not just God and his providence that's mysterious, but even the decisions, the actions, things that for us would have, we could honestly say, well, he must have been writing something and he must know what that is. For him, it's unclear. He remains a mystery. There remains a desire to know him more, even after all the exegesis and all the hard work and all the philosophical clarification, he is still greater, even as incarnate, than any of us can possibly imagine. Um, so last uh, lectio for the fourth week of Lent, I gave a somewhat, what would you say, tendentious reading of the gospel based on things that I have imagined and I hope are true, but it's really hard to say whether they can be borne out by the sacred page itself. So I'm going to continue in that vein with inventive exegesis. Um, so one of the things that I'm struck by is that this woman is caught in the very act of committing adultery, which is fascinating. Uh, because either she was just really imprudent in the place that she selected for her act of adultery, or, you know, it happened by happenstance that, that people kind of happened upon her and whoever her partner was, or they laid a trap for her. Um, and if they were to have laid a trap for her, that's really damning. Um, that's kind of terrible to think that, well, we know that she's going to do this, so we're just going to lay a snare for her so that we can have irrefutable proof so that we can, end, you know, like we can put her to death. It's like those present are, are jonesing for her to die and that they're going to use it for the twofold reason of one, killing her and two, entrapping this teacher who's been saying all kinds of wild things, which they find troubling. So they're going to kill two birds with one stone. Oh my gosh. Wow. Holy smokes. Such terrible punnage. All right. So they're, they're pleased at the, uh, at the twofold office, which they will fulfill in this particular act. But that's just, it's awful in, in, insofar as they're using their, their minds and their hearts to set snares. They're using their minds and their hearts to reject the truth for one, and then to kind of weaponize the truth or militarize the truth, which is, for two, also terrible. And I think this, this reveals to us kind of, by contrariety, the way in which we're supposed to be, you know, living our Christian lives, but the way in which we're supposed to be friends as well. Uh, so on the one hand, we want to have a, an openness to the Lord, and that should manifest itself in the way that we treat other human beings, which is not to lay snares for them, but which is to kind of coax the good out of them, right? So we get this kind of blueprint for it in the Gospel of Matthew. You go and you correct one by one. If not, you bring a friend. If not, you do it in the context of the church. But the whole goal of fraternal correction is that you would love the human being unto a higher state, is that you would bring about some kind of change or conversion which would redound um, you know, to their growth in the spiritual life. And I think that if we're able to interiorize this grace by an openness to the God who gives it so freely, then it helps to correct our understanding of God himself. Because I think a lot of us think that God is just waiting in his heavens until such time as he finds a good opportunity to smite us on account of our wrongdoings. But that's also decidedly not the case. God doesn't sna like set snares. God doesn't lay traps. Um, God is actually prompting us. God is inviting us. God is goading us. God is you know, doing the things such that we receive the graces so that we can make good on them and, you know, grow in the grace of conversion. So God is poised to bless. God is poised to pardon. God is poised to exercise mercy. And, and we see that in the flesh. I mean, in, in the person, in the witness of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it all kind of comes to this what would you say, like a kind of summit of revelation? There's a kind of mountaintop from which our Lord preaches the fact that God is merciful and that that mercy is able to, to radiate through our own humanity and change every aspect of it. In, I guess, as is usually the case with the Pharisees, the Pharisees uh, are wrong, not entirely, but in, in part. Um, and our Lord, in his interactions with the Pharisees and scribes, often makes this point in some way, you know, that in, in, in this passage uh, from today's gospel, the Pharisees are not wrong in condemning adultery. That, you know, adultery is a sin. In fact, our Lord calls it a sin and calls in, in a way the woman a sinner when he tells her at the end of this passage to go and to sin no more. She had to have sinned in order to be told not to do that again. Otherwise, that doesn't make sense. So the Pharisees are correct in that. As 
Father Gregory and Father Bonaventure were explaining where the Pharisees get it wrong is in 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 their objectification, in their use of a human being so as to accomplish their nefarious ends. Um, the woman is a sinner, and perhaps the law does condemn such such sin uh, to death uh, to the sinner uh, does condemn the sinner uh, to death. Um, and our Lord isn't. This is often this passage is used as a as an example or a way by which to say, well, we shouldn't judge others. We shouldn't judge others. Well, in fact, you know that's that's not the case either because we have to judge between good and wrong, and we have to, as Father Gregory was explaining, in seeing something wrong, call our brothers and sisters to a life of goodness and a pursuit of virtue. Ultimately, the what our Lord is revealing to us in this gospel is is the one our humanity. Um, that human beings are not simply objects to be used as as things to pronounce judgment on either a good object or a bad object, but that we are that we are human beings, and in being made and and existing as human beings, we are called to life with God, with Christ, uh, to His mercy, um, to His to a life of perfection uh, that begins in a, a, a turning from sin a fighting of sin in our own life, of temptation. Um, but ultimately, as Father Gregory has said, I think early in this episode, that uh, the Christian life is not just about not sinning, but about living the divine life, about living in union with Christ. And ultimately, the woman caught in adultery here is 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 that example, a woman who was caught in sin, but who received the greatest you know, mercy to be forgiven, to be corrected, forgiven, and um, strengthened in her pursuit of of goodness and holiness. All right. With that, thanks so much for having joined us for this uh, Lent Week Five Lexio Divina. We hope that uh, we hope that it has been of service to you, of benefit to you, in your own walk with the Lord and your own uh, growth in the liturgical prayer of the Church. Uh, so we can go and conclude with the prayer of the people from today's Mass. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant that what at your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks again to all of our supporters. If you would like to tithe to our work, please check us out at patreon.com slash godsplaining. Please do follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And then if you would, please like and subscribe and leave us five-star reviews since that helps to get the word out for all those who might stumble across it on the internet. Uh, and then please do visit godsplaining.org to shop for merchandise and then get dates and information for upcoming events. And specifically, we have those three retreats coming up this summer. So two in July, one in August for all comers, young adults, and then uh, young adult men. So yeah, you can find all that at godsplaining.org. Our prayers are for you. Please pray for us, and we will catch you next time on Godsplaining. <laughs>